Aw, hi everyone. Hello everyone. <laughs> All right, getting better, getting better. Um, welcome to Astronomy on Tap. Uh, how many of you all uh, have been here before? All right. And how many of you, it's your first time? All right, welcome, awesome. Give everyone a, hand, a round of applause for those who uh, discovered us for this month, that's exciting. Well, you're in for a good treat. We have two excellent speakers today, uh, both alum from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, yeah, couple fans, all right, cool. Um, okay, great, so uh, I'm Tracy uh, Becker, one of your hosts, and we have Christine Ray. And, woo! Michael Velez. And? Oh, I'm back. Brian Beck, over here on. <laughs> Um, and Aaron is in the back. He's going to help us out tonight, too. Um, yeah, so we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So what is Astronomy on Tap? Astronomy on Tap isn't just us in this room right now. It's actually a worldwide event. Um, I forget where it started, but it has locations all over the world now, a lot in the U.S., but um, we're, you know, spreading out across all of the continents. So everywhere, people get together once a month and talk about astronomy at some brewery and have a lot of fun. And I think that's the astronomy on tap, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, oh. You wanna continue? Oh. That would have been helpful earlier, huh? Um, okay, what did I say? Monthly event, it is a monthly event in San Antonio also. Um, you can follow us there if you wanna keep up with our future events, especially if this is your first time and you just enjoy it so much, you can't stay away. Um, World-class scientists, we got that. Interesting, yes, that also. You can win prizes. We will have trivia and prizes at the end of this. Um, we got some extra special prizes, in fact, actually, because I was cleaning out my apartment and find a, found a bunch of cool space stuff to give away to all of you. So you have that to look forward to. Um, okay, and that is astronomy on tap. Very good. <laughs> all right, tonight. Uh, we have two great speakers with us, as, as Tracy mentioned. So first we have Dr. Christine Ray, uh, will, who will be presenting All Mespexes Live in Texas. <laughs> Exploring an extraterrestrial ocean with Europa Clipper. Uh, that'll be a very exciting presentation because Europa Clipper is really cool. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, then we'll take a break, uh, everybody. Um, you can order food and drinks and check out our merchandise. Um, and, and of course, always please uh, order from the servers in here. Don't, don't, go to the car, don't go to the bar, don't crowd the bar and stuff. Um, and then we'll come back, um, discuss astronomy in the news uh, with uh, our usual Caleb Gamar. Um, and then we'll go straight to um, Dr. Michael Starkey's presentation, the reconnection between the solar wind and the Earth, uh, that's also a very cool topic, uh, because, um, well, you'll see why. <laughs> I'm not gonna give it away. And then, of course, after that is trivia! That's uh, all the great prizes. Um, so, without further ado, we can... Uh, oh, and th throughout the night, uh, you can uh, tweet or Instagram through um, your thoughts and any photos through AOT, S-A-T-X, hashtag in front of that, I forgot that. Um, and then this QR code sends you there, probably. Um, I don't know. To our website. And then if you have a question at all, you can feel free to text uh, uh, for, for the speaker so that we can ask afterward, 954-871-5620. Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm prepared to get blasted with messages. <laughs> um, and now, without further ado, we can get started on our program. Okay, so how many of you here were here to find out all about Mespexes that live in Texas? All right. Um, okay, great. So we are excited to introduce, uh, to present Dr. Christine Ray, who has been a 
uh, an organizer with us for many years now. So we're sad to see not only is this the finale, uh, her giving her presentation, but also it's her last day here um, as an organizer and in San Antonio. So everybody, before she even gets started, let's hear it for her going on to her next. And um, so Dr. Christine Ray just finished a mini postdoc at the Southwest Research Institute where she worked on the Europa Clipper mass spectrometer team. She's also an alumni of the UTSA SWERI PhD program. Where she wrote her dissertation on the habitability of ocean worlds. In just a few days, she will be hanging her hat in Tennessee on the drive from Texas to Washington, D.C., where she will be starting a new science policy fellowship. But despite this, she will always love Europa and hopes to one day see a Europa lander dig beneath the ice and find all of the ice squids. <laughs> And her drinking word, for all of you who are new, what we do is when she says the drinking word, you're gonna raise your glasses, say woo, and take a sip. And her drinking word is life. Just a reminder, drive safely, carefully, responsibly. We are not responsible for you getting home safely, so please make sure you do so yourselves. All right, and with that, we'll hand this over to Christine. Hi. Am I, do I need to be here? I guess I do. This is a bad angle, but you know what? It's all right. Like here. Okay. All right. Hi, guys. I, as Tracy just introduced, am Christine Ray, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Europa Clipper mission, um, and particular, particularly the role that Texas will be playing in the Europa Clipper mission. And I hope you all enjoy it uh, as much as I do. Okay. Is this gonna work? Uh, oh, maybe it's this way. Uh, it's that way, okay. Except I jumped ahead. Okay, so before I dive into Europa, Europa Clipper, um, we've kind of hinted one of the exciting things about Ocean Worlds about Europa Clipper is the life <laughs> aspect. Excellent. Um, so I kind of want to talk to you about, about how we're doing that. How do we look for life in the universe? Well, <laughs> oh gosh, this may have, um, hello. Okay. Pause. Pause on the life. One person got it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Are we good? All right. Okay. So we know there's life on Earth. We have one data point on that subject. Um, and based on that one data point, we've amassed a list of what we think we need for life to exist somewhere else. And that is a few things, the first of which is time. So the earliest evidence we have for life on Earth is about three, oh gosh, about, <laughs> about 3.5 billion years ago. So fossils um, that emerged roughly a billion years after Earth was formed, there could be earlier stuff, but still, you need some time to cook all of your ingredients together to make habitable conditions on a planet to get life to form. And the next thing we need are chinops. So carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, the six chemicals that make up the building blocks of proteins, uh, lipids, carboxylic acids, everything that makes up living things on Earth. Um, and we know you can find those elements in the rocky cores of planets and moons, so that shouldn't be too much of a problem. You okay, Michael? <laughs> uh, we also need energy, so two types of energy. So a chemical energy source, something for living things to eat, um, and we also need a physical energy source in order to make liquid water. So liquid water, it's abundant on the surface of the earth. A lot of us are drinking it right now. That's no problem here. But other places, that could be difficult. Because in order to, oh, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Um, OK, what was I going to say here? Yes, all these things, we need all that. Life uses it all. Um, and what we want to do next, then, is go and look for all of those ingredients in a variety of other worlds in the solar system. 
I'll let this play through so you can fully appreciate this little gif here. I like this one, it looks like Europa. <laughs> he found life. Okay, so why is that difficult? Well, if we want to take the follow the water approach to astrobiology, we need to be in this thing called the Goldilocks zone. So you've got your sun here, it's very hot. You're gonna hear all about the sun, in fact, from our next speaker. Um, as you get closer and closer and closer to the sun, it gets very hot, so hot, that the Texas power grid collapses, your water just boils <laughs> off into gas, you can't get life there. As you move further away from the sun, it becomes very cold. The Texas power grid still collapses, and all of your water uh, condenses into ice and freezes. You can't get liquid water there either. You need to be here, just right, in the Goldilocks zone for life to form. OK, that's cool. So that's how we thought that you made liquid water on a planet. Um, but it turns out there's one more way you can do this. So a little physics 101 here. Um, I'm going to use an example. This is Jupiter. As most of you probably know, it is a large ball of gas out in the solar system. This is Europa. It is a small ball of ice that is orbiting Jupiter. Jupiter is tugging on this this way. But Jupiter has a bunch of other moons, including Ganymede, which is another small ball of ice orbiting Jupiter. But it's in what we call an orbital resonance with Europa. So these th two things are orbiting in such a way that Ganymede is also constantly pulling on Europa in this direction, while well, Jupiter is pulling on it in this direction, and that differential force of gravity creates a gravitational potential energy, and that gets converted into heat energy, and you make, and you make, what do you make? Oh, you make Fox Mulder, and then you make liquid water. And you get an ocean world. So um, these things are exactly what they sound like. They're little worlds that have oceans on them. Um, but the cool thing about these is unlike Earth where you just have water somewhere, these have a global subsurface liquid water ocean. So the entire thing is covered in ocean. So um, this is Europa as an example. It's got a lot of rock. It's large enough. We think it also has a metallic core. The ocean spans the entire thing. And then you have the ice that we see in images on top of that. This is another little cross section that just shows you the entire planet. Again, ice, ocean, rock. That's an ocean world. Okay, so now that we know ocean worlds can exist, we know they're a thing, again, if we're taking this follow the water approach to looking for life, then uh, we now have the Goldilocks zone still, that's all good, but now we've opened up the rest of the outer solar system into places where life could potentially <laughs> exist. Um, and it turns out we have a lot of these ocean world candidates. Some are confirmed ocean worlds, some think we could be ocean worlds, but all of these things across the outer solar system we think could have abundant liquid water on them. So it's really cool too, because Earth, like that's a fairly large planet as far as the rocky planets go. It's got 1.3, I believe the Z stands for zeta liters of water on it. And then we look at like, the Jupiter system, for instance, and we have Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, these things have two to 30 times as much liquid water on their surfaces as Earth do. And they're tiny, tiny, tiny little ice balls. They're a fraction of the size of Earth. So that's pretty impressive. And that tells me if we want to look for water to find life, then we should be going to the ocean worlds. And if that still wasn't enough to convince you that we need to go visit ocean worlds if we're looking for living things, then, let me tell you about some other fun effects of this tidal gravitational heating that I explained. So the first thing we can create are these hydrothermal vents. So what is that? Hydro means water, thermal means heat. So that's exactly what it sounds like. If you have, again, this gravitational force heating up your whole moon, then you can also heat the rock underneath. And if that rock is in contact with water, then you get these hot water rock reactions. And that creates a whole bunch of interesting chemistry and pulls up these Chinox elements I mentioned out of the rock and into the ocean where life can then use them. Um, and in fact, we actually think it's these hydrothermal systems where life originated on Earth. Like this isn't just something we made up. There are hydrothermal vents on Earth. We think we could find them on ocean worlds too. The other really cool thing about, again, gravitational heating on ocean worlds are plumes. So gravity, it's crunching the whole ice ball, it's melting the ice. Sometimes at the surface it can also crack the ice. And if you crack it all the way down into the ocean, you create a vacuum in space. It sucks up ocean water and shoots ocean water kilometers into space, um, which is pretty cool. 
And we actually think, again, looking at Europa, that Europa has these plumes, which is very exciting. So we've looked at Europa with the Hubble Space Telescope a few times. They found what they think is evidence for plumes just by looking for hydrogen and oxygen in certain abundances that indicate water is condensed there. Um, the Galileo magnetometer team, after these observations came out, said, looked back at their data and said, oh yeah, there, there could be plumes there too. So we've got a few lines of evidence indicating that there may be plumes in Europa. And that's great for us because it means we can fly a spacecraft right through the plume and sample the ocean that way instead of having to land on the surface and drill through 10 kilometers of ice to get there. Um, so Europa, good candidate, has an ocean, potentially has plumes that we can sample very easily. Um, this is all good news. So why don't we just go there and uh, land some people on Europa and look for the ice squids? And that's actually, I wanted to give a shout out to this movie called Europa Report. Has anybody seen this movie? Okay, a few of you. I highly recommend it. Um, I didn't know Europa was a thing until I watched this. It was like, I cannot believe that's a real place. And then found out there was a whole mission going there. Um, spoiler alert, so they send some humans to Europa. They're doing much like what people here are doing. We're looking for microbes. We're looking for what's going on at the ice shell, stuff like that. Um, but then they all get eaten by ice squids at the end, which is very exciting. Um, and as much as I and maybe others in this room would love to go and get eaten by an ice squid in Europa myself, um, it turns out that NASA has a more kind of conservative process for sussing out ocean worlds for life before we're going to be allowed to do that. And that is the Europa Multiple Flyby Mission, otherwise known as Europa Clipper. So this thing right here, it's going to be launching in October of 2024. It is a targeted mission to Europa, so that's the first time we've had a mission going to suss out an ocean world specifically. We've obviously investigated other ocean worlds and other missions, but those have gone to things like Saturn um, and just accidentally found ocean worlds in the process. This time we're like, we know Europa's cool, let's send a mission to that and that alone. Um, and it's going to pass over Europa 45 times, which is a lot, um, a lot more than we've ever done before, and do lots of interesting things with these nine different science investigations or instruments that we're sticking on there. So that's a lot. This is a very big, expensive mission, nine different science investigations. Um, we're going to do lots of really, really cool stuff, and I wish I could talk about them all, but I only have so much time here. So I want to highlight these three here, because those are all coming from right here in Texas. So well, three out of the nine science investigations, Texas is building like 30% of the science on Europa Clipper, which I think George Strait himself would be very approving of. <laughs> okay, um, so the first is reason. So this is the radar for Europa assessment and sounding ocean to near surface, which I know is quite a mouthful, um, but it's a radar. So there's two different kind of types of radar that go with this. One is this big long tube up here. The other are these little, little, it's still pretty big, but like compared to this guy, it's little. I think this is like 60 feet long or something like that, just to give you an idea of how massive the spacecraft is going to be. Um, but anyway, there's two types of radar. And that's so we can have two different frequencies coming from a radar. So the way radar works, if you're not familiar, it basically just shoots out radio waves and they bounce off of things and we can detect when they reflect and come back at us. And by measuring the time delay between when you sent it out and when it comes back, you can figure out the composition, the structure of the thing that you're trying to penetrate with your radar. So that's exactly what we're doing with Reason. Um, again, the target is the ice shell, so you can figure out things like where do the ice and ocean meet? How thick is the ice shell? Are there like little pockets of water in the ice shell? This is all gonna be really crucial if we did want a lander, for instance, at Europa to decide what the most interesting site to sample is and where we think ocean water is gonna get closest to the surface. Um, the next one is Europa UVS. I will say I'm not on this instrument team, but several people in this room are, including the PI, so I apologize deeply for what I'm about to say. Um, if I screw something up, I'm so sorry. So UVS, it is an ultraviolet spectrograph, and it is being built right here in Swiri, San Antonio. Yeah. Um, and in fact, this image, which Tracy just sent to me, um, is, I, I believe, a photo of what it looked like right before they sent it off to be incorporated onto the spacecraft. They were the very first ones to finish their instrument to do that, so that is pretty exciting. Let's give a round of applause to them. Uh -huh. Good job, UVS. Okay, 
So ultraviolet spectrograph, um, what does that mean? Well, it means it measures light in the ultraviolet wavelength. So unlike when you take a photo with your camera, what you and I are seeing here, that's all in the visible wavelength. The ultraviolet wavelength is more high energy than that. So it's things you can't see with the naked eye. But it's really important to look at those wavelengths because that can tell you what's floating around in the atmosphere. So this instrument is essentially going to look at what kinds of chemical species are in the atmosphere in the plumes. And the extra exciting thing is that that is actually a great way to look for plumes in the first place, to confirm that they're there. Because again, if you can find that hydrogen and oxygen in the right abundances condensed together and say, okay, there's a plume there, that's gonna be crucial. Because then we can take the spacecraft and fly through that plume and sample it with something like mass specs. The mass spectrometer for planetary exploration, which is also being built in San Antonio. Woo! And this is the instrument I work on, so I'm very excited to tell you guys about this. All right, so that's mass specs. It's also a long tube. Um, it's an in situ instrument. So again, if we're flying through a plume, this is gonna be very exciting because we are taking a sample of that plume vapor directly. So essentially, again, you're flying your space back through the spacecraft through the plume, you take a sample of that gas, you put it into mass specs, it shakes it around and says, okay, here's the chemical composition of what's in there. And we can do a couple cool things with mass specs. So again, we're looking at chemistry. Um, on our first flyby, we're gonna immediately send gas into the instrument and downlink pretty quickly what we think the chemical composition is. The full spectrum, that is like a massive thing that will take a while to figure out, but at least with like in a couple of hours even, we can get back like here are the main species that are here. And that's really cool because we have some other features of mass specs, um, which namely is the cryo trap. And that's what it sounds like. So we have this cold trap on, attached to our instrument that can actually take a sample of that Europa gas and carry it later in the flyby and analyze it then, which is great for a couple of reasons. One being that there's only so much power that we have available to our spacecraft. And a lot of those instruments are gonna be turned on right here during flyby and they're all gonna have to share the energy budget. budget. So if we have something that can actually do operations up here when we're no longer close to Europa, that's great. It means we have a little bit more uh, horsepower available to us. The other cool thing about the cryo trap is that we can search for chemicals that are present in much, much, much lower abundances. Um, like what, you might say? Well, we're looking at all of these things. This is basically a summary of what I worked on as a postdoc for the last six months, but we're looking at all for all of these things with mass specs. So at the surface, and during that original flyby, you might just get some of the most abundant species, but then based on what those things trace, we can look for things present in much, much, much smaller abundances and get the complete picture with this cryo trap. So what does that include? Well, volatiles and organics, so gaseous species and organic compounds, things with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, things that make up, I bet you uh, thought I was done, the building blocks of life. Um, and then, so, I mean, those are like good for life already, right? But they are also produced by these hydrothermal systems I mentioned, these things where we think life may have originated in the first place. So by looking for these things, we can figure out what's happening in the interior if these hydrothermal systems are present, if we have the ingredients needed for the Chinops elements for life. Um, and we can also look for life itself in mass specs. So one of the things our team is working on is actually taking microbes from Earth and shooting them through a mass spectrometer and looking at what the chemical signature of those microbes is so that we can go to Europa armed with that information and say, okay, uh, we might not have found this in the initial flyby sample, but we can look for those things in our cryo trap sample that are probably present in very, very low abundances and figure out if there's microbes there, figure out if there is life coming out of Europa. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. And all, all in all, if there's just one thing I wanna leave you with today, maybe details of all the instruments aside, um, and again, that was just 30% of them, the 30% coming from Texas, there's a lot more and they're gonna do equally cool things. It's that Europa Clipper, Clipper as uh, Michael Velez told us over, is pretty cool. Like this, the kind of stuff we're doing with this, with all the instruments on here, is absolutely state of the art, combining that with the fact that we're sending a mission to an ocean world specifically for the first time, like this is gonna be mind blowing. Um, so again, launching in 2024, I think we're gonna get there around the 2030s, hopefully get data back shortly thereafter. So hang out for another like 10-ish years and uh, maybe we'll have figured out if Europa is habitable and whether there is life there itself. And that is 
all Mulder has for you and all I have for you. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Christine. Wonderful talk. Thanks. Right around of applause again. I think it was a very good <laughs> Europa discussion. All right, so we got some questions. Just a reminder, um, uh, uh, the number 954-871-5620, or you can raise your hand if you would like. Um, <laughs> I prefer that. Um, but we do have a question. The first question is, what's the difference between plumes and geysers? Oh, that's a great question because there's like a lot of different things that are called plumes in ocean worlds alone and it gets very, very confusing during meetings. Um, so I would say, and I'm not a geologist, so if there's a geologist in the room and you want to correct me, feel free. I would say they're the same thing um, and that a plume is like a type of geyser. The main difference, uh, oh, being that a geyser is something that we, you know, see on Earth in a gravitationally bound system, and a plume is just a result of this vacuum in space kind of dragging things up that way forcefully. Oh, that's a good idea. What was the number? 9548715620. Uh, <laughs> that looks like too many letters. No, it's not. Okay. Is there a difference? in mechanics from radar versus echolocation? I mean, the, the fundamental concept's the same, like you're bouncing a wave off of something. Um, obviously, a radar is a radio wave, an echolocation. I think it's just their cute little clicky noises, like bouncing off of the walls, right, that works. Um, and that's, that's telling you distance. So I'd say you get more information with the radar and bats, I think. I don't know about bats either. Uh, but I think they're just like clicking around and saying, okay, I've got a wall over here and a wall over there. And oh, I can fly that way through the door. That's fine. I think that's how bats work. Um, whereas the radar is telling you not only how far things is, but also kind of what the, what the um, composition of things are. So the reason we selected these two different frequency ranges with reason, I say we, I'm not on the reason team either. I'm just doing my best here. Um, the reason they selected them was because they are targeted for specific materials like ice, like water, like brines, maybe, um, just to, to, to figure out, okay, if there's ice here, it's going to go this far, and then if there's something else here, then it'll bounce back so we can tell this is ice, but this is ocean, things like that. So you get a few different levels of information. Thank you. Um, I don't see, well, there's one, oh, a whole one. Um, is there anything in the room? Anybody would like to raise their hand and be brave? Yes. I got one. Yeah, I have no idea why we think Pluto's an ocean world, to be honest, um, because I don't know, I, I mean, it is part of the Kuiper belt, right? So maybe if you have other Kuiper belt objects tugging on it, that's enough to create that differential pull. But yeah, it's definitely an outlier and everything else is a moon orbiting a gas giant and that one's not. So, excellent question. That's all I got. Do you know the answer, Sam? <laughs> Well, we kind of are. Juice is kind of doing that. Um, Juice and uh, Ganymede and Callisto is a target, right? But I think it's primarily Ganymede. Mm -hmm. So I think we were just like, we'll let Europe do that and we'll do this and then we'll collaborate and then we get them both. And I think also we, we know a little bit more about Europa just because maybe we like found it first. I think when Galileo flew by, that was like the first time we even were like, hey, that's a thing that's weird. It has an ocean. Wow. So I think it just maybe got like dibs that way. Also, the possible plumes helps. Well, yes, the possible plumes. I haven't seen too. that on Ganymede. <laughs> also true. Um, yes, there are questions on here. Um, what happens if signs of habitability are detected with Clipper? Uh, w w will it know if there is life, and do we go back? 
Um, well, great question. So habitability, uh, what someone once said to me, just because it's habitable does not mean it's inhabited. So there's kind of, in my mind, two, two criteria to make life. One is, is it habitable? And two, are, does it have the conditions for an origin of life scenario? The problem is that we don't know what the origin of life scenario actually is because we don't know what it was on Earth either and people keep arguing about it and they're like wet, dry reactions. It has to be in the air, it has to be in the ocean, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think we can just safely ignore that for now and kind of tell those people, well, you can't prove yourself right, so we're just going to go back anyway. I would say if there are strong signs of habitability, and especially if there's plumes, then we definitely have a case for at least putting a lander there next after we've fully, well, I mean, we've kind of developed some of the tech for the lander already, um, but I would say if Europa Clipper is wildly successful, then yeah, we for sure have a shot at getting that, um, getting that done. It'll take a long time, but you know, in the next in the next decadal survey, I think that that might have a fair shot, especially if Europa Clipper is finding some cool stuff. So, yep, that's a very fingers point. crossed. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, we got. See, Stephen has a question. So you fly by forty-five times. What happens then? What happens to the spacecraft? Um, well, I think they're planning on crashing into Ganymede, right? Yeah. Um, which is cool because normally they crash it into the gas giant, so this will be a fun experiment. I also have been told that um, most of the time what they predict we're going to be able to do is not actually, like it's an underestimate and we usually have a lot of leftover juice left, like beyond our wildest imagination, so hopefully it will end up even being more than 45 times. Um, but yeah, the plan right now is to crash it into Ganymede, which I like a lot. Yeah, special. You know, juice. Mm -hmm. juice can maybe look at it. Mm -hmm. Get some. Um, all right. The last question I oh, like. We have, I like. We have a hand oh, up too. oh, okay. Where? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, um, that's a great question because it's something we're already doing. Like the Mass Specs team, especially, I think I think there's a lot of different teams in Europa Clipper that actually have their own simulations and models. Because um, we also, forward modeling is really important for this stuff. So being able to say exactly what we think Europa's atmosphere is going to look like in different density distributions and stuff like that to be able to decide what we want to prioritize first. Um, and then that also saves us some work because we already have the model. And then when we get there and find out this isn't true at all, then we can just tweak it a little bit, add some updates, plug in the new numbers and say, okay, now this is saying this would be a really interesting spot to look like, to look at, and then go in there. So it's kind of a living, living models that are going to keep evolving throughout the mission lifespan and hopefully after the mission lifespan too. <laughs> Very good. Uh, is that in the room? Because this, this li I like this, this question. What advice would you give a teenager who is interested in space study? Oh, um, take a lot of physics and math and programming as early as you can. Programming, especially. You don't think you'll need programming to do space, but that's all you will do for a long time. Um, so definitely take those classes, get involved in research as early as you can. Um, even if you're at like a small university that doesn't do a lot of research, they have a lot of these summer REU programs. Um, kind of meant for, meant for these smaller, um, what do they call it, teaching schools where people don't have access to research necessarily. Shoot your shot, apply to those, and for sure, um, just keep, keep trying. I mean, most things, it sounds cheesy, but like, you know, if you, just, if you just don't give up and just apply to everything, don't get imposter syndrome. Don't ever tell yourself like, oh, they're not gonna take me, I'm not good enough, because I, you know, shot myself in the foot one too many times doing that. Just be like, do it, shoot your shot. Shoot your shot everywhere you possibly can. Um, that's, uh, well, Python, I think, is a good one now, but anything would be helpful because at least just learning how coding works, you can learn a new language more easily than just learning how to code in the first place. So that's what I got for you. Very good. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker once again. <laughs> All right. Break time. Uh, come on up for merchandise um, or... And, uh, yes. And... Uh,
Be sure to order more drinks and food as needed, and we'll see you soon. Okay, everyone. Let's settle back in. Second half of our program tonight. We will uh, start with our monthly segment, Astronomy News, Astronomy in the News, and uh, as usual, uh, Caleb Gimar, a uh, student um, in the UTSA SWERI program, uh, will give the news, um, and, uh, and let's give him a round of applause. All right, so hello, and uh, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started with this month's section of astronomy news. A uh, fair number of things to run down here. So let's see, first of all, the September skies. So this is what the evening sky will look like around 10 o'clock p.m., about mid-month. Uh, again, we do have this wonderful Milky Way overhead. If you are out in a nice dark sky, please do observe that with binoculars if you are under a very dark sky. An awful lot to see there, cannot stress that enough. But Jupiter steals the show this month. So in this uh, image here, you see it rising over in the east. Wait until about one o'clock in the morning. At one o'clock in the morning, later in the month, around September 26, it's going to be almost right in front of you in the south, uh, there in the sky, and it will be at opposition, meaning that we will actually be extremely close to Jupiter at that time, and it will be very, very bright. If you're observing it with a telescope, you will get a very nice view of that planet. Uh, through a telescope, generally, you are able to see the four largest moons uh, orbiting around the planet, uh, Ganymede, Callisto, Io, and Europa, what we tend to call the Galilean moons. So you do not want to miss that. Uh, also, do not miss Saturn if you have a telescope. It is generally over the south during much of the month uh, right there. So again, never want to miss the ring wonder. And yes, you can see the rings through a backyard telescope. Now the big news for this month is an upcoming impact of a spacecraft with an asteroid, actually a moon of an asteroid. Uh, the uh, DART mission will actually be conducting this uh, impact uh, experiment on the uh, moon of the asteroid Didymus. Uh, that um, uh, that uh, moon is uh, named, uh, someone remind me, I'm sorry. Dimorphous, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, that moon is Dimorphous, and uh, that will be happening on September 26th. In the lead up though, the imager on board the DART spacecraft actually has a very slight view of the uh, asteroid system itself, Didymos, right there. Earlier, uh, just a little over a month ago, the announcement was made that another mission that is going on right now, uh, the Lucy mission, actually has one more target added to its um, uh, slate of asteroids to visit. So this mission was originally scheduled to um, visit seven asteroids, but in the intervening time, they found out that a couple of these asteroids have moons as well. So that count has went up to nine for the Lucy mission. Uh, the uh, asteroid Polymel has a very small companion as well, so uh, when uh, the uh, Lucy mission reaches that asteroid, uh, they will be able to get an examination, not only of the primary asteroid Polymel, but also its uh, companion asteroid. So this was a rather interesting uh, discovery that was just announced today. Uh, data from the Very Long Baseline Array. This is a group of a number of uh, radio telescopes that are spread over a, a wide swath of the United States. Uh, has been used to produce a very detailed orbital map of a uh, binary star system with an exoplanet within it. So uh, in this uh, rendering here, you see the larger uh, orbit of, the, uh, of one of the members of the binary star system, and then the uh, larger member of the system right there, and then the planet orbits within. This is the first time that uh, any such detailed imagery has, or sorry, not imagery, any such detailed orbital information has been produced 
for uh, such a system. Uh, in case you all know, that is the binary star system with planet uh, GJ896AB. How many of you are going to remember that name tomorrow? <laughs> Didn't think so. All right. So again, very, very fascinating discovery uh, using radio astronomy information. James Webb Space Telescope keeps producing some really great preliminary information and it will be very fascinating to see what comes even farther down the road uh, from that space telescope. Uh, so one of the announcements that was made just a little bit ago was that uh, there actually is a exoplanet that has been directly imaged by James Webb Space Telescope. This is somewhat preliminary, uh, but nonetheless uh, observing this star, HIP 65426, uh, James Webb was able to use the um, uh, various instrumentation to observe this exoplanet so the main star that it orbit orbits around has been blocked here and then you have uh, the exoplanet itself appearing as the blobs in these different wavelength images and if you did not see just a couple days ago this really beautiful image was revealed from Webb this one of the tarantula nebula and I cannot stress enough Please go online, download the full resolution version of this picture, zoom in on it, you will not be disappointed. There are so many little details here that are not apparent in this uh, lower resolution copy that I've used in this presentation here. So definitely uh, find some time to take a look at that. Really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, come on, there we go. So. Do not miss, again, I always say this, the solar eclipse is coming up. In 2023, we have an annular eclipse coming up. That's just next year. And so in that annular eclipse, if you have some of those nice uh, solar eclipse glasses, you can take a look at the disk of the sun and you'll see this shadow of the uh, moon passing in fracture. It's not really a shadow. It's, it's the, the silhouette, I should say, of the moon passing in front of the sun. And of course, in 2024, a total solar eclipse where if you're in the line of totality without the glasses on for a brief moment of time, you'll be able to look up and see the moon blocking the sun completely and the outer atmosphere, the corona of the sun in very great detail. So you do not want to miss that. Eventually, SLS will launch. I know this is supposed to happen a little bit ago. It didn't happen last week as we all hoped it would, but it will happen. If you could wait for James Webb, you can wait for SLS, okay? So just keep uh, watching out for that. Uh, very eager to see uh, that rocket launch take place. And with that, uh, that concludes Astronomy News. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Caleb, thank you. Um, let's see, I think, I don't know if we're going straight into, let's see. Yes, we are. All right, Christine. Okay. I would like to, is this, this is on, right? Okay. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michael Starkey, also a UTSA SWERI alum. Um, <laughs> So Michael just completed a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics. At you just completed, no, that was a while ago. Completed a Bachelor's of Science in Mathematics at UT Austin. He then joined the UTSA SWERI Graduate Research Program and obtained a PhD in Physics in May of 2021. So congrats on that accomplishment, which was recent. As a graduate student, he used data from the Magnetospheric Multiscale, or MMS, mission constellation to investigate particle acceleration at collisionless shock waves in space. That sounds very complicated. He also assisted in the calibration of the Superthermal Ion Sensor, or SIS, which will fly on the CUSP mission. Michael started his postdoc at SWERI in July of 2021, where he performs research using data from the Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX, and Parker Solar Probe, PSP, spacecrafts. His research interests include the interaction of the solar wind with Earth's magnetosphere and solar energetic particles in interplanetary space. Uh, what is your drinking word going to be? Okay, well, TBD then. 
Uh, let's give it up for our speaker. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I want to note that that instrument, the SIS, is supposed to be launched on the uh, Artemis one, and it wasn't, so I'm <laughs> waiting for that. Very excited. All right, uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for the introduction. And so today, today I wanted to talk about the interaction of the solar wind with Earth. The interaction of the solar wind with Earth's magne magnetosphere, or its magnetic field. And um, in particular, I'm going to talk about a fundamental process that occurs there called magnetic reconnection, uh, hence the title here. So we'll get to that. But first things first, the drinking word. All right, so today I chose plasma. Um, yeah, get ready to drink. <laughs> um, so plasma is an ionized gas of... of <laughs> An ionized gas consisting of positive ions and free electrons. And it's really, it's a fourth state of matter. So, uh, sorry. So if you start with a solid here, that's really referring to a collection of atoms that are rigidly held together. They're not really free to move independently of each other. As you start adding heat, these atoms or molecules begin to um, have a little bit more freedom. They can move a little bit more, and that's what we call a liquid. You keep adding heat, these atoms, molecules, um, they'll eventually get to the point where they have enough energy to move kind of freely of each other and independently. And so that's a gas, like the stuff we're breathing right now. Now, something really cool happens once you keep adding heat. Uh, the actual atoms themselves start to break apart and electrons have enough energy to be free um, from that bound state. So when that happens, you get a collection of positively charged ions and electrons that are just flying around each other and can move in basically independently of each other. Now, the one um, similarity between solid, liquid, and gas is that typically these atoms, molecules making up these states of matter are not charged. They're neutral. Uh, but so with a plasma, you, it's a different... <laughs> You have charged particles moving around, um, moving around each other. And so what this means is that when you have an external magnetic field or electric field, these charged particles are going to feel that and they're going to react to that force. Um, what makes it even more complex is that Maxwell's equations tell us that moving, particle, or moving charges will generate electromagnetic fields. So in this plasma, uh, <laughs> These particles are really, it's a really complex and dynamic interaction where they're reacting to external fields, generating their own fields, and um, makes it a really fun mess to try to describe mathematically. But, so that's a whole um, uh, topic in space physics, and is plasma dynamics. Uh, so now, contrary to what a lot of people think, space is not empty. It's full of plasma. And... <laughs> That's, again, uh, part of the stuff that I study. So. so, again, the talk today, I wanted to describe how this, the solar wind, which, I'll just, which is, well, I'll get to that, the, how the solar wind interacts with Earth here. So it starts with the sun. The sun's a big ball of plasma that is constantly undergoing fusion at its core. Uh, this, there's a lot of other processes going on that result in it uh, constantly emitting UV light and uh, the visible light that we see today. In addition to that, it's constantly emitting this highly charged, high energy flow of particles, ions and electrons. And so this is what we call the solar wind. It's this constant flow of, of charged particles that are being emitted from the sun and basically in all directions. So as this plasma or solar wind expands from the sun, it fills the heliosphere and it'll um, interact with different bodies in the solar system, such as Earth. So you might think, you know, this really high energy charged particles coming at us sound, sounds kind of dangerous. Um, it is, but luckily we have a nice magnetic field here that protects us and acts as a, a shield, uh, shields us from these particles here. So that's the initial step in this interaction. Um, once these particles cross this, what we call a bow shock, which is, is analogous to, think of a, a large rock in a, in a river, you get a, a wave standing in front of that. 
And that wave is really deflecting and decelerating those water particles around the rock. And so that's the kind of the analogy here for what we call this bow shock, which is a, a magnetic collisionless shock wave in space, which we don't have time for that. So, uh, so anyways, this, uh, as the solar wind comes in through the bow shock, it, it reaches this point where it kind of comes to a standstill. This is where the solar wind pressure balances with the magnetic pressure from the Earth's magnetic field here. And this is what we call the magnetopause. At that point, something really cool happens, which is magnetic reconnection. And this is a fundamental process that conver basically converts magnetic energy into uh, kinetic energy. And this is a process that happens all over the universe at, at uh, supernova shocks in the coronas of different star systems, our sun for one, and also at planetary um, systems here, or in, at planets here. And so what this does, we'll, we'll get into it in more detail in a bit, but it basically allows plasma to be convected up and over the poles of the Earth and into the magneto tail here. And, and then and once in the tail, you can get another bout of reconnection, this pla which sends plasma earthward and tailward, and that can cause, result in things like um, the auroras or substorms, which can disrupt technologies here on Earth or in space too. So the point of this is just to kind of show that or describe the real general process by which solar wind uh, plasma can enter into the magnetosphere and how it circulates throughout the, the whole global magnetosphere. Um, so this, I believe, yeah, this is just a little movie showing, um, you know, depicting solar wind particles coming in, interacting with this, not really the bow shock, but we'll call it that for now. And um, you can see they're just deflected, decelerated, and move around the Earth. Now, zooming in on the poles here, and this is um, how auroras, one way that auroras are generated, but we can't really talk about that for the time's sake here, but it's just a pretty picture there. Uh, but one, one thing I wanted to say is that an important feature of the solar wind is that it has an embedded magnetic field, which we call the interplanetary magnetic field. So this is the magnetic field that's connected to the sun. And as the solar wind expands from the sun, this field becomes frozen in and this, the plasma kind of drags out the field along with it. And this has implications for uh, magnetic reconnection that takes place here at Earth, as we'll see. Okay, so this is a, a Dungy cycle. This is basically um, the cycle that describes how plasma circulates throughout the whole um, Magnetosphere. This is a really old schematic. We don't need to, you know, spend too much time on it. It's, um, but just kind of the idea is that solar wind comes in here from the left. Left, you have the IMF interplanetary magnetic field um, being dragged along. As it encounters Earth's magnetic field here, you can get reconnection, which I promise we'll talk about in just a second. And once that happens, this plasma can, is actually accelerated up and downward in this image and can kind of be dragged over the poles here. And you can see, so this magnetic reconnection is resulting in a change of magnetic topology where the, the IMF field line is now reconnecting to one of these Earth field lines. And so I'll kind of get into that in a little more detail here. But um, yeah, I just wanted to show that this, this is a little more detailed schematic on how this process is taking place. And again, eventually this plasma enters into the tail, and, and which is what we call the, the backside of the Earth's magnetosphere here. And once it's there, it can be undergo reconnection and be accelerated away from the planet or towards the planet. And again, this can then result in things like the auroras where particles funnel down the field lines and um, generate uh, Nice, pretty lights. Yeah. All right, so what is reconnection? Oh, do I? Sorry. All right, reconnection, yes. It's a uh, physical process that occurs uh, basically all over the universe, and it's where, ma again, magnetic energy is converted into uh, kinetic energy in the form of heating or acceleration of the local plasma. So, so as you can see here, um, this is kind of a really basic schematic of what takes place. This is, these are magnetic field lines, and it's now when you have two populations of plasma where they have oppositely directed magnetic field lines at their interface, 
eventually you can get enough, if you have the right conditions and you have pressure building up and things, those field lines can snap, kind of. Um, and they, 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 not snap, but they, enough pressure builds up to where they can, it's a violent process that just reor, re, reorients them in some way. And what happens is you can see this downward facing field line now connects to the upward and vice versa. And when that happens now, these field lines are accelerated away from the reconnection site. And that also, um, that energy from the magnetic field lines goes into heating of the particles and accelerates them away. Um, so this is a little bit of a nicer schematic or more realistic. And you can see you have the opposite directed field lines here. You have plasma flowing in from the top and bottom. And once reconnection goes, you get what we call plasma outflows, or plasma jets, or plasma uh, exhausts. And, um, and so uh, this is one of the telltale signs of reconnection that we can measure in space. And, and now you can, you can kind of think about if you had a spacecraft that's equipped to measure magnetic fields and um, ion velocities and electron velocities, and then say that spacecraft flew right through one of these reconnection events. Well, you could probably paint a picture of what's going on by looking at those observations. So that's exactly what uh, the MMS mission does here. Um, it was a, so it's a, it's a mission that's comprised of four identical spacecraft. It was launched with the, sole, with, with the primary goal of investigating reconnection here at Earth. And um, it's, it has some really um, high capability instruments that allows us to do that. And so what we're looking at on the left, so these are uh, figures from a, a, a science paper by Jim Birch, who's the SWERI vice president. And um, he's, um, in this, in this uh, paper, he was looking at an actual event in which MMS flew right through a reconnection site, right there. So this is a simulation reconstruction of the event. But you can see as the four spacecraft are coming up, there's a reconnection that takes place right there. You can see by the field lines that then shoot up and downward. And so this was really kind of a lucky find and it was a really cool event to look at. <clears throat> and so I just wanted to show this, this figure here, which is actual observations to give you an idea of how we diagnose this reconnection uh, with using in situ observations. So what we're looking at is a snapshot where the four spacecraft are located right near the reconnection site. And these circle plots are velocity distribution functions of the electrons. So it's, it's basically telling us how many electrons are moving at what velocity. So the distance away from the, the center represents the velocity. The color says how many particles are moving with that velocity. And we just focus on these two. Well, look at the green spacecraft here. That's right above the reconnection site. And so what, what do you expect? Well, we remember there's the ion and electron outflow. So that um, means that electrons are being, should be being moving away from the reconnection site. And if you look in this, this distribution here, well, that's exactly what we see. We see this kind of crescent feature, and its electrons are moving upward away from this reconnection site. And you get a similar um, thing down here. It's not as well pronounced, but um, this was just a kind of quick overview and idea of how we can actually look at this reconnection and um, analyze it using in situ data from different spacecraft. And, and again, this, this really allows us to probe the, the uh, more fundamental meanings and, and workings of magnetic reconnection. Um, so with that, yeah, I'll just um, summarize up. It's a little quicker, so, but, <laughs> but um, so again, Earth's magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. It's, it's, it you know, gives us, a, it shields us from these harmful rays and particles and plasma. And um, I mean, look what happened to Mars. It's, they, you know, so we wouldn't be here without Earth, I mean, without the magnetic field. Um, anyways, and the, sur the solar wind circulates out through the magnetosphere via this Dungy cycle, which is really enabled by magnetic reconnection. And magnetic reconnection, again, is this fundamental process occurs all over the universe, and it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to study. And yeah, thank you. Go Plasma.
Oh yeah, there's some auroras. So. Hello? Hello. Switch. Oh, there's a switch. It would help if I turn it on. <laughs> they don't they don't teach this stuff in magnetosphere class. <laughs> Blame Steve. Um, <laughs> Um, a very, very, with a sink again, Dr. Starkey. Um, very cool topic. I remember when I first learned about magnetic reconnection, it sounded like something an evil scientist would do, you know, reforming yeah, magnetic lines. it doesn't make lines. too much sense, but. You know, that's like, ooh. <laughs> um, all right, uh, we do have some questions before, you know, uh, we get the number up. Um, so, a general one, what is, if any, the difference between uh, magnetism, electromagnetism, and gravity? That's the question. So, I mean, electromagnetism and gravity are fundamental forces. There's four fundamental forces. Uh, there's the strong force, weak force, um, basically E&M, electromagnetic force, and gravity. Gravity. Um, so, the difference between it would be, I mean, I don't know how deep to go into this, but uh, <laughs> the, I mean, so electromagnetism is basically driven by charged particles, electrons and protons, and you have this attraction, um, you know, protons and protons will repel them, and electrons and protons will attract to each other. Um, gravity is driven by, like, the Higgs boson particle, which I don't know too much about. But. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically it's anything with mass will have an attractive force towards it. So it doesn't see charge or anything like that, but it, 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 um, it's a force that just depends on mass. And, um, yeah, so I hope that answered the question. Very good. Yeah, I think that's good. Um, do humans have a plasma field or plasma body? Well, I don't know. <laughs> we should measure that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess. Bring MMS like, back. You know, you rub, you rub your arm with a balloon or something, you can, there's some kind of um, static electricity, you know, electric effect going on there. So I haven't thought about that too much, though. It is an interesting. Um, wh what happened to Mars? Oh, it, it, yeah, solar wind took over. <laughs> no, um, so Mars didn't have a, or it, it used to have like maybe a, a magnetic field, but over time the solar wind basically um, eroded the Martian atmosphere, I think, and um, kind of, so without the atmosphere and without the, it doesn't have an internal, internally generated magnetic field, um, I guess because it maybe cooled down too much. I'm not a planetary expert, but, I, so Earth's magnetic field is generated by um, its, its mantle that's basically moving plasma, um, which, which, which generates a magnetic field, and that's why we have that, this nice dipole magnetic field protecting us. And I don't think, and Mars doesn't have that, so they didn't have this, this um, magneto, magnetic field protecting them, and over time their atmosphere got eroded away by the solar wind, I think. And, and so, I mean, it's still there, it's still a nice planet, I think, but it just doesn't have humans yet. That's very... All right, uh, the next one, I, I think this is a good question too. What has been the coolest discovery by the MMS mission? Probably um, electron scale reconnection. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, so I actually don't study reconnection that specifically, but um, that would, that's the one that I've heard about the most from the MMS mission is electron scale. So, um, I guess before MMS, they thought that the reconnection was only, or they didn't know or thought that reconnection was only occurring on ion scales, um, and or that, that the ions and electrons were always involved. But with MMS, they were able to probe much smaller scales um, in time and in spatial distances. So they were able to see events in which only the electrons were taking place in the reconnection process and ions weren't, um, were, I don't know, I guess oblivious to it. 
Um, so that, that was a big deal in the, in the scientific community, yeah. And actually, I think the paper I was showing was, actually, I don't know, I don't want to speak to that. Yeah. If you're standing at the pole, or either of the poles, are you in danger of being hit by the <laughs> solar wind? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, I'm, so I mean, yeah, part of these particles will, I mean, we're getting hit by radiation right now. There's galactic cosmic rays that are coming in and they penetrate through our, our atmosphere and uh, the magnetic field. So you're always getting hit by some tiny, tiny, you know, dose of some kind of particle, but um, no, I wouldn't say you should worry about standing at the pole because that interaction uh, with the aurora, the, the atmosphere stops m most of it, pretty much all of it, yeah, so. That's good. <laughs> yeah. How does magnetic reconnection vary at other planets, uh, and is it different than what happens here at Earth? Well, um, so I mean, the, the mech, we, we're lucky that we have Earth as kind of a laboratory that we can actually send spacecraft to. Um, now I know that there's been work at reconnection at Saturn uh, by one of our old, own grad students, Ryan. He's, uh, but you know, so I mean, I, as far as, I mean, it's a fundamental process. So of course there'll be differences in, in, in the way it looks at different planets, but you know, for instance, here at Earth, we have a, a what we call, on the day side, for instance, it's asymmetric reconnection, and that means that on one side, you have a much higher density of plasma, and on, one, the, on the other side of the reconnection lines, it's much lower, and that, you know, has certain implications for how it looks. Um, and so, yeah, there's different types of reconnection. Um, so, it, yeah, it'll look different at different planets, but the, the fundamental process remains, I think, the same. Very good. Um, I think I'll, I'll hold this as, we'll, we'll take some, yeah, from the audience, yeah. What plasma? What is plasma? Oh, so plasma is, it's basically, it's when you add, you know, you take a, a gas and you just keep adding heat to it, that's one way, I guess, and um, eventually, eventually the electrons and in these neutral atoms will have enough energy to break free of their bonds and kind of, um, be moving freely about in tandem with the, what's that? Superpowered liquid light? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, what, what's superpowered liquid light? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no, yeah, okay. oh, like liquid, I get it, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just really hot, charged, gas that's you know flowing around it's 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 too hot to where the the particles don't stick together anymore so you have um you have electrons literally you know they break apart from their helium atom parent atom and so now you have a, a positively charged helium ion and an electron moving around instead of them stuck together moving around together Yeah, but friction is, I mean, on Earth when we have, you know, it's, it's like air friction, for instance, it's, it's in space, the density is so low that you're not going to have particles actually colliding. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a cool thing. It's, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's, it's everywhere in space, but it's not, I don't think it's too, you know, here on Earth there's, we have laboratories for it, but I don't think it's very common. Um, I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I actually don't know, but it could be. I mean, if anyone else has a comment on that. Uh, it is not known about the potential laws of the solar rays that we can predict the size and strength of the solar rays from the blue light or giant or a red dwarf or other types of stars. Is it for that to be determined? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I wouldn't be, t I haven't looked at, you know, how we can predict it with other systems and things. Um, I mean, we know quite a bit about it, um, but as far as, we know, you know, for instance, there's fast wind comes from coronal holes and um, you have slow wind from a 
basically non-coronal holes and things like that. But as far I, I mean, as far as the actual speed or density of the the wind, um, I'm sure you could probably like get measurements by over a long time or some somehow. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, TBD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, we, the more we can understand about our sun will definitely shed light, right, into uh, other stars um, in the galaxy. But uh, so right now I know, for instance, one place that reconnection takes place within the sun or in the corona is um, it's, it's responsible basically for accelerating x-rays and, and flare production, solar flares and things like that. Um, and then there's, I think there's papers out where there's reconnection taking place in, in turbulence as in the solar wind as it comes out. But, but yeah, I think, I mean, understanding how this reconnection and where all it's taking place and how it, 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 it um, you know, competes with these different forces. I mean, it's not a force, but this, this process, how it um, um, produces res these, these high energy particles that will then, I think that's, uh, you know, a good, something that needs to be further understood, I guess. But, I mean, there would definitely be implications in that it'll help us understand, you know, how the solar wind is generated and what makes these different structures and transient events that come off of the sun. Um, so. Uh, let's, uh, I, 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 I don't want to cut anybody off, but we do have to move on. So let's thank again, once again. Thank you, guys. If, if you do have any questions, I'm volunteering you to answer questions offline. So just find him and ask him. I, you know, executive decision. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all for coming. How, what did you think of our two speakers tonight? <laughs> Woo! And a big thanks to Caleb as well for astronomy in the news. Um, and of course, a big thanks to Blue Star for hosting us. And don't forget to tip your server, ser, ser, waiters, waitresses, servers. Thank you. I can see the word. Um, OK, so next up, we do have uh, some trivia. So if you, uh, we do have also upcoming events. So next, uh, next event will be on October 5th. Uh, so don't forget, mark your calendars. Uh, it, we generally do the first Wednesday of every month, so we'll see you back then. Let's get started with our first question. Question one. The Carrington event, one of the largest recorded geomagnetic storms, occurred in what year? We have A, 1806, B, 1859, C, 1994, D, 2000, or E, 2018. The Carrington event. Question two. How long can an average magnetic storm power the city of San Antonio? A, one minute. B, one day. C, one month. Or D, one year. We are assuming the power grid is okay. We're, we're stable in this situation. Assuming San Antonio was in any other state. <laughs> to question three. Roughly how long does it take for solar wind to reach the Earth? Um, I, I, I'm just in case, clarification. From the sun, obviously. It's coming from the sun. Um, that's, that's how the sun's giving it out. Um, a, one day, B, two days, C, four days, D, eight days, or E, uh, 12 days. How long does it take for the solar wind to reach the Earth? Okay, question four. How many objects in the solar system have been observed to have active plumes or volcanoes? A, one, B, five, C, 10, D, 15, or E, 25? And this is just the solar system. Question five. Before Europa Clipper's upcoming exploration of Europa, several other of NASA's mission have flown by Jupiter and its moons. Which of the following was not? 
a spacecraft mission that acquired data of Jupiter and or its moons. We have A, Galileo, B, Voyager, C, Pioneer, D, Dawn, and E, New Horizons. Which one of these did not take any data of Jupiter and or its moons? Question six. On September 26th, what part of the asteroid, I say Diddy Moss, will NASA's DART mission impact? So we have A, its northern hemisphere, B, its moon, C, its largest crater, D, its water deposit, or E, its plume. Once again, on September 26th, what part of the asteroid Diddy Moss will NASA's DART mission impact? This is a memory recall question. If you don't get it, I know you weren't paying attention. The bonus. What are the six main chemical elements that make up living things? Once again, another memory recall. Yep. All right, everyone. We have our, our winners, but uh, as usual, we're going to show everybody the answers so you can either feel good or sad. But really, we should all be feeling good because tonight was fun, wasn't it? Yes. All right. So for question one, uh, which was the question about um, the, um, uh, uh, I, I really should give myself notes. Oh, the Carrington event. If an incident like the Carrington event occurred in the present day, it could affect mobile phones, internet, and satellite communications. However, this was not a problem in 1859. The answer is B. But, and this is just, well, no, yeah, just, just somebody shout out, what existed in 1859 that would be an uh-oh? Thank you. So, you know, that's almost like phones going out. So this was a big deal. All right, question two was about uh, uh, how long we could be powered um, from, from an event. And the answer was one month. A typical magnetic storm contains 10 to the 15 Joules, 10 to the 15 joules of power which can power San Antonio for approximately one month. That's a lot of power. And boy, would that have helped us during the winter storm. All right, question three is, well, I wrote that one, I should know, is about how long it takes for the solar wind to get from the sun to um, uh, uh, here at the Earth. And the answer was C, four days. The, the calculation is 1 AU at 400 kilometers per second average is roughly 4.3 days. Uh, 400 kilometers per second is the average solar wind speed. So that's roughly how long it'll take to get here. All right, question four was about... Um, yes. Unfortunately, I have none. Uh, no. Question four was how many objects, oh, no, no, this one was uh, how many objects in the solar system have been observed to have an active plume or volcano? And the answer is B5. Earth, Triton, Io, Europa, and Enceladus. Um, if you said one, you probably forgot about Earth. Earth is a planet. Remember, Earth is a planet. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. <laughs> um, uh, well, we went with objects, so it's an, it is an object. But uh, all right. Question five was about um, was about which spacecraft did not go to the Jupiter system at all, and the answer was D. Dawn. It explored two asteroids in the asteroid belt, so it didn't make it all the way out there. So. Pat on the back if you got it, because that one's... Uh, Galileo, I mean, uh, you know, the name is implies the Galilean moons. That's, it was named that way because it went to Jupiter. Um, Voyager, which is still going all the way out, skimmed by Jupiter on the way and took beautiful photos. Pioneer, um, it's another old one, but it also took pictures of, of Jupiter. And then New Horizons, famous for Pluto, but it did do important Jupiter science as well. Um, New Horizons, oh, 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 that's, 
It's far out, man. <laughs> um, I don't know. No, New Horizons. It's still in the Kuiper Belt. I know that much. Still in the Kuiper Belt. Yeah. Um, all right. Question six was about the um, was a memory recall about the dart. What is the dart impacting of an asteroid? What piece of the asteroid is it impacting? And it's impacting its moon. Uh, this is really exciting. Um, and and honestly, September September is a fun month for science because we have. We have a, a, a dart doing, uh, doing this, and um, speaking of Juno, uh, of, of, of Europa, the Juno mission is even gonna pay, pay visit a hello, so Europa's getting some love, so September for the win. All right, the bonus question was about which are the six elements important for um, life? And if you, uh, the the way I always remember it, and and you know, um, it is is you know, it sounds like schnapps, and you really do need schnapps sometimes to get through life. Um, but uh, uh, C H N O P S: carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So give yourself a pat on the back if you got them, because that's yes. Round of applause. And that brings us to the end, so that means it's time for winners. Let's, who's ready to win the number one prize? Drum roll. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, number three prize. Number three prize. Wait, 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 wait they're first, right, because they got up. Yes. Yeah. Wait, no, no, they, they, this one. No, because they forgot. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, so for the third place, Slightly unprecedented. I, I think it's happened before, but we had a we had a pretty good tie. We couldn't break the tie. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring both t people up here, and then you all decide how you're gonna split the multiple things for winning um, civilly. We have a third place, Scott T, and Team One. Hello. Come on up, and round of applause. Yes. Oh wait, uh, both of you can get take a take a Europa sticker. You know, that way both of you can get one. Everybody deserves a Europa sticker. Um, that one's too okay. All right, in our second place spot, we have, oh, I like this team name. I like this team name. I'll give you a hint, I'm from Miami. The winner's Florida. Oh, oh God, okay. <laughs> Round of applause. Yes, yes. All right, the grand prize that Europa posters included. The grand prize, you're getting a whole lot of stuff here, so get excited. J&M. Woo! Come on up. Look at this. Stickers galore. Uh, look at this, this, this beautiful bag. Um, it's a, it's an, it's an ESA bag. ESA is the European Space Agency. All of their missions. And this, sorry, it's crumpled. I hope you can flatten. I, you I know. Can flatten. Okay. Thank you. This is a blast. Thank you. Yay! Woo! Thank you. All right, round of applause for all our winners. And if you didn't win, applause yourself, because everybody got at least one right. So you know, we're all winners. Just some more than others. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And of course, uh, thank you to the speakers, Christine, Dr. Christine Ray and Dr. Michael Starkey.
Thank you again to Blue Star and to your servers. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all back here in October. So thanks again. Feel free to hang out. Come talk to the speakers. And uh, we'll see you all next month. And merchandise. Come get merchandise, keychains, fun stuff, stickers. Cheers.